Well, hey there. Welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I am the curator of astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And in this edition of the program, we're covering the dates of April 25th through March 1st, 2022. We're going to start by talking about International Dark Sky Week that's going on now. And we're going to discuss the effects of light pollution in our lives. Then we're going to mention that amazing gathering of planets still going on in the east in the morning and mention the moon passing by, as well as an amazing conjunction of two planets getting really close and we'll end with a look at a partial solar eclipse coming up over Earth and one that happened over Mars as well. So let's get to it. When we think of nature, sometimes we solely think of the flora and fauna and the landscape around us here on Earth. And of course, that is always worth protecting and preserving, especially since we just celebrate Earth Day on April 22nd, a day for us to cherish the Earth and to help us remember why we need to protect our home planet for us for the plants and animals, and for future generations. But also our night sky should be included in that protection as well, and something that's overlooked at times. So that's why it's great that this week is what's called International Dark Sky Week. This is an international celebration of the night sky above, and it also brings to light all that light pollution that now fills our sky at night. And unfortunately, nowadays, this light pollution is something you almost cannot escape. And according to the International Dark Sky Association, it's a wonderful organization that serves to protect the skies, they say that 83% of the world's population lives in an area with light pollution, and that may be increasing by about 2.2% every single year because of development and growth of our cities and our towns and all of our other activity that we've increased over the years. And of course, we do need light at night for us to see and for us to do things safely. But of course, we can have a little too much of anything, especially with artificial light. We have too much of that light that shines into the sky and makes it really hard to see the beauty of the universe because our sky is our window to the universe. And not only does light pollution affect the appearance of our night sky, but we have found that it has major consequences for plants and animals here on Earth. It has shown that many migratory birds die each year from hitting buildings in large cities because of the bright lights coming from them. Insects can get very confused, moving towards artificial light that we've all seen, disrupting where they congregate, and also making it troublesome for our lives as they congregate around our homes and the lighting around it. Baby sea turtles have definitely been in impacted and that's very relevant to us here in Daytona Beach where we have miles and miles of nesting areas on the beach one of the largest actually in the world and the baby sea turtles that have newly hatched have been shown to sometimes go towards the light in the city as opposed to go back into the ocean and many die from going the wrong way and many other animals get drawn to the light at times which can be very confusing as they may be involved in traffic accidents on the road or interactions with us or our own animals and even plants have been shown to be affected by this. Some plants only bloom at certain times, and even their seasonal patterns of when leaves fall or the regrowth of certain types of plants can be interrupted by too much light at certain times of the year. It's even been found that our own health can be affected, adding so much light at night, possibly disrupting our circadian rhythm and our very important sleep cycles. And energy is a big one because there is a ton of light that is shined not only downwards, but upwards. And that upward facing light actually serves us in no real way. It's all waste. And that extra energy waste can contribute to climate change and other issues that we're dealing with today. And there are some studies that show that even crime may not be mitigated or prevented by having lights around us. There are some studies that show that it's not really as effective as we previously thought. And even our own road safety can be affected by these extra lights. Glare from really bright businesses and street lights can make it very difficult for our eyes to adjust to light and dark areas. And there are many other consequences that we might not even realize or fully understand until it's far too late. And of course, protecting our night sky for our own viewing and even astronomy itself, the study of our universe, is just one more reason for us to be aware of our influence of the night. 
And I've always held the belief that if all of us had a dark sky to look upon more often, that more of the world would enjoy the universe more in astronomy and science. Because how could you not appreciate the universe we live in when you see a sky like this? And here in Stellarium, I often show a really dark sky to kind of illustrate the possibility of what you could see. And it does make you think about people long ago when there was no artificial light pollution and when folks were observing the skies, it totally makes sense why all of those constellations were created over time, all of the rich storytelling that happened, the cycles that were observed and were known very, very precisely because everyone paid attention to the sky. The sky was the calendar for us throughout the year before we could write that down or have digital means of keeping track of time and with a really dark sky that was much easier to do and much easier to appreciate all of this above us at night and one thing i try to do in my career is really try to promote this idea that the night is a beautiful thing that should be cherished and just enjoyed generally the night offers so many things that don't occur during the daytime certain animals come out at night and their behaviors change and you see all sorts of things you don't see during the daytime. And there's a really great book that I always recommend called The End of Night, Searching for Natural Darkness in an Age of Artificial Light. And it's a great book written by Paul Bogard, who is a English professor. And he really waxes poetic about the true beauty of the night and to fully appreciate it especially if you have a chance to go to very dark locations. So we always hope that International Dark Sky Week can shed light on light pollution and its effect on our lives in many different ways. And maybe it can convince us to turn lights off when we don't need them, or even purchase certain types of light fixtures called full cutoff fixtures that help to shine the light downwards instead of upwards. And that may actually save energy if you don't need as many lights, if you're lighting up the air around you more efficiently. Because again, we don't need to light upwards. It doesn't actually help us in any way. And you can even create lighting around a home that just looks more beautiful if you play with dark and light areas a little more creatively instead of just blanket an area with really bright, harsh light. It can make cities and towns and suburban areas just look more beautiful and pleasing in the evening and while possibly protecting the skies above. And it's something that some cities have tried to do, becoming dark sky areas. There's even dark sky places you can find, especially on the International Dark Sky Association or the IDA's website. They have some maps showing some state or national parks or wildlife areas that are designated dark sky places. It's a program they put together to help sort of protect certain areas around the country. And you can find these various areas in your local community that serve as dark sky areas that can just look beautiful for our night sky and they protect many other things again the flora and fauna around those areas of course you have a lot of places out west where it's much darker but even places on the east coast of the united states um, there are locations to find using a tool like this and to track where light pollution is growing or where to find dark locations as well, there's some wonderful maps that you can find online that show you those types of places. This is from a blue marble map that you can find at this link. And it shows you places around the world where the light pollution is concentrated, especially the large cities coming here to the United States. You can really see these large metropolitan areas with all the light pollution and the areas around them that are a little bit darker, but that's all growing. Again, 83% of the world's population has some form of light pollution. At least here in the United States, more than two thirds of the population cannot see the Milky Way from where they live, which is just a really sad thing to think about. And we have some other similar resources like lightpollutionmap.info that also shows the light pollution in various areas. And actually with this particular map, you can actually click on a particular area here. It will tell you the brightness of the light pollution and what's called the Bortle class number. And that's actually a light pollution scale. The higher the number, the more the light pollution. And if you click on that, at least on this website, it brings you to another page that explains the Bortle sky level here. And on the left, it tells you the number and just to the right of that, the color code for their own map and also kind of what the sky is sort of like and some other details as well. So a number one is a very dark sky. That's the darkest sky you can get to. Those places are pretty rare these days. And then two is an average dark sky. Then three is more of a rural sky. Four, a rural kind of suburban transition zone, kind of in between. Five is kind of a suburban zone around large cities. And then as you get to larger suburban areas, 
to number six. And once you get from a suburban, as you transition to a city, you get to seven and then eight. And then of course, nine, those are the largest cities, metropolitan areas that have a tremendous amount of light pollution where you can't see much in the skies above. So a lot of places, especially in the United States, kind of run between the five to nine category, but that is actually averaging upwards every single year. We're getting less and less of these lower number Bortle sky levels. And heading back to Solarium, you can actually simulate varying levels of light pollution using that Bortle sky level. So I have it now set to level nine where you can barely see anything. Maybe some of the brightest stars in the sky, you know, stars like Sirius might still be visible and some others. And of course the planets and the moon can be seen too, but it's really hard to see much of anything, which is so unfortunate. But if I go to the options here, the sky viewing options, and I can turn on this dialog box, we can actually change the light pollution level from a nine. Let's see what eight looks like here. So a little bit darker, still a pretty large city or town. We'll move on to seven, which this is much of the sky here in Daytona where our museum sits. And then we move on to six and five. You start to see a bit more of the sky and especially some of the dimmer parts of a constellation. And we get to four and three where you really start to get much more of the skies above and maybe starting to see a hint of the Milky Way which is just so beautiful if you have a chance to see it. And then down to two, and of course one are some of the darkest places. These are usually wildlife areas very far away from cities, much of the time in the western part of the United States in the desert, on top of mountains, and it can get even better than this. I can actually turn off the atmosphere. And you can have places where the Milky Way is so bright that you can almost read by the Milky Way if you allow your eyes to adjust and you can see globular clusters and nebula better, even the galaxies with your naked eyes. And that kind of view is something that more people had long ago that I wish more people had today. And I've been to a couple areas like this in my life and it's life changing for sure. I always hope that people have a chance to see the universe like this. So I hope we can all appreciate International Dark Sky Week here that runs from April 22nd to April 30th. But this is something that we should think about all year long because it affects us no matter what. So happy International Dark Sky Week and just happy dark skies in general. As we once again head back to the early morning before sunrise, looking towards the east, we can continue celebrating this planetary festival that's been going on. It's been absolutely amazing to see so many planets gathered in this area. And now we have the date set to Tuesday morning, April 26th. And this is when we have the four planets that we've been talking about. And I'll turn on some labels for them, but we can kind of reiterate those with Jupiter here, Venus, Mars and Saturn. But by this morning, you can see the moon joining in here, a nice waning crescent moon on that morning, the 26th here, Tuesday morning. And as we move through the week here, I want you to pay attention to not only the moon and where it goes, but also the two planets nearest the eastern horizon. And that's these two planets right here. So let's move on from the 26th and go now to the 27th. And that's where you're gonna see a really thin crescent even closer to Jupiter and Venus. So that's gonna be a really nice group right there going on. Makes a little triangle in the sky here. The moon should actually be a little smaller than that because we have it exaggerated in Stellarium, but you'll still see it in that area and it's gonna look really, really cool. And they're sitting within about a four degree circle in the sky, so that's pretty close. Moving on from there, we're gonna to go to the 28th where you see the moon move closer to the sun's glare and even a smaller crescent and then to the 29th. And now as we get to the 30th here, by the end of the month, look at how close Jupiter and Venus are. They are getting really close. This is the 29th. Then we'll get to the morning of the 30th, that's Saturday morning, and now they're at conjunction here. That's when they are so close in the sky. So as we get closer, I'll turn the labels back on again so we can kind of see what's going on. It's kind of neat too that Neptune is also in this area as well. You need a telescope to see it, but that's also in this grouping of planets. So on Saturday, April 30th in the morning, you see Jupiter on the left, the largest planet in the solar system, of course, much farther away than Venus, which is to the right. That is the brightest planet in our sky. So Venus will be much brighter than Jupiter, but they're still both very bright in the sky. These are the two brightest planets you can see from Earth. And you can see them in one field of view in binoculars and even a telescope. You can see them in your eyepiece in one area, which is great. And then we'll go to Sunday the 
first here, Sunday morning, and then you'll see him kind of switch a little bit. Jupiter will then be a bit above and to the right of Venus right there. And what's happening is actually Venus is moving a little bit faster than Jupiter, and that accounts for the biggest change there. Jupiter moves much slowly against the backdrop of stars than Venus. So you find those two, and if you have a telescope looking at these two objects, maybe you'll see the moons of Jupiter, Jupiter itself, and if you're lucky enough, maybe even some of the phase of Venus. Venus is in kind of a gibbous phase, more than half full. But to see those two planets so close at conjunction, they're getting within about 0.23 degrees. And I say this all the time, but remember, half a degree is about the width of a full moon. So this is just under half of a full moon's width in separation. That is really close and just a very nice conjunction going on there, along with having Neptune in the sky nearby and Mars and Saturn. So definitely take advantage of that conjunction and this planetary festival, I like to call it, in this area in the morning towards the east, just before sunrise, maybe in the 5.45 to 6 a.m. time frame. You can get out even earlier than that, but by then these objects will be just a bit higher in the sky. If you happen to find yourself in the lower part of South America or in the Southeast Pacific Ocean near Antarctica, then you may have a chance to see a partial solar eclipse happening in the afternoon of Saturday, April 30th. Again, this is only a partial solar eclipse and that's when the moon covers up just part of the sun as opposed to a total solar eclipse when the moon covers the sun completely. Partial eclipses occur when the Earth, Moon, and Sun do line up, but not as precisely as when you get a total either solar or lunar eclipse. But when they occur, if you have solar eclipse glasses or any kind of safe viewing means, it can be a really nice event. And again, you have to be in a fairly specific part of the world to see this. Here in a map provided by timeanddate.com, they show the eclipse area and where maximum and the more partial parts of the eclipse can be seen. So if we look here, there's the southern part of South America and in any populated area, maybe in Chile and Argentina, is where you would see kind of maximum partial eclipse in this sort of orangish zone here. And this is much of the southeastern Pacific and very near Antarctica as well. So this is a pretty uninhabited area. There's not going to be many folks there, but maybe that very southern tip of South America there, and even parts of Argentina, Paraguay here, where it's a very partial eclipse kind of moving up into the middle section of South America as well. So not huge population areas, but still kind of fun to mention. And if you were in one of these areas in South America and you were looking on this day, this would be kind of the early afternoon into kind of middle afternoon here. And this is the local time of about 1.26 here, already when the eclipse would have already begun. And this is not the view you'd actually see. You wouldn't actually see a dark moon there and the sun. You would actually need solar eclipse glasses or some very safe way to view this. You have to be very careful. You can't look at this with your naked eyes because the sun will damage your eyes just like it would any other time if you were staring at it. And there you have the moon blocking a bit of the sun here. We have a little bit exaggerated so you can see it a little bit better. If we click at least on the sun here, we can kind of keep this in view as we watch this sort of play out. And as we do, you'll see a bit of the moon cover the sun, a decent amount of it as we get later in the afternoon, local time in South America. This is getting into kind of the 341 time frame as we get into about even four o'clock in this place that I have set to, that's when the sun and the moon would be setting in this part of the sky here towards the west. So that's kind of neat to see that eclipse if you have proper viewing equipment, solar eclipse glasses, or a solar filter on a telescope. But the main reason I wanted to mention this is because there is another eclipse captured on another planet, and that's the planet Mars. So if you didn't know this already, you can actually set your location to Mars in Stellarium and look at the sky from there. It's always fun to do. So I've placed ourselves in the location of where the Perseverance rover is situated on Mars, that rover that's been driving around the surface, now looking for life on this planet. And occasionally, the various rovers that have been on Mars will capture an amazing celestial event from this planet. Sometimes it catches eclipses. Of course, not of our moon, but of its own moon, in particular, Phobos. Mars has actually two tiny little moons, Phobos and Deimos, which are very small. Phobos is about 25 kilometers across, about 16 miles across, while Deimos is about nine miles across at its longest width. 
These are sort of misshapen, not completely round objects, or sort of like captured asteroids around Mars more than moons, but they do orbit around Mars and very close to it. Especially Phobos, the bigger of the two. They're named after the twin sons of Mars, who's the god of war, or also known as Ares. Their names mean fear and terror. But anyway, these moons going around Mars, they have very tight orbits around Mars, and especially Phobos, the bigger of the two. Phobos only takes seven hours and 39 minutes to go around Mars once. Phobos orbits around Mars only 3,700 miles above the surface, as compared to our moon, which is about 242,000 miles above our surface. But of course, our moon is much larger. So since Phobos is so close to Mars, it only orbits around the planet in about seven hours and 39 minutes. And once it rises, it only takes four hours and 15 minutes for it to cross the sky and then set once again. So it actually has the opportunity to do that twice per day, to rise and set twice and move very quickly across the Martian sky. And occasionally, if Mars, Phobos, and the sun line up, it can create an eclipse just like an eclipse that happens on Earth. It's just a smaller type of eclipse, or sometimes we just call this a transit. And this has been captured on Mars from various rovers. Spirit and Opportunity have done so before with their cameras. Curiosity, that's been on Mars since 2012, has done that even better. But this latest one coming from the Perseverance rover is the greatest and looks absolutely amazing. This occurred on Mars on April 2nd. And here in Solarium, I have everything set to that time. We can actually watch that eclipse occur here. And then I'll show you the real video taken by the Mass Cam Z camera from Perseverance. It's amazing. So we can actually zoom into this area here. This is a nice Martian day. And if we do that, the sun was a little higher in the sky, which actually means that Phobos is a bit closer to Mars at that point, which also means that it covers a bigger area of the sun at that moment during eclipse. So if we actually kind of center on the sun itself, we're going to center that and we'll move through time here. And eventually you're gonna see in the screen here, Phobos start to cross the sun. I'll go a little slower than this and there it is. We're gonna zoom in a little bit and there's the moon there. This is not the perfect size of it here, but at least gives you kind of an idea of this moon crossing the sun, kind of creating a partial eclipse, a very partial eclipse. And then soon after it moves across the sun completely and only takes about 40 seconds, at least in this particular eclipse that occurred on April 2nd. So it's a very fleeting moment because the moon is traveling so quickly around Mars. So that was observed by a rover on another planet from a camera on that rover that was then sent back to Earth for us to watch. And here is the video on NASA's JPL YouTube page where you can see this transit occur. That's a video of the sun and Phobos crossing over that sun. You can see the misshapen appearance of the surface of Phobos. Again, that's only about 16 miles wide, crossing over the sun in about 40 seconds here. It's a little bit longer, but you can really see the process play out. And this was a series of pictures taken by Mascam Z on Perseverance. Those series of pictures were put into a time lapse and into a video that we could watch. And the detail is absolutely amazing. You can see sunspots on the sun and a lot of the detail of the surface of Phobos as well during this eclipse or this transit on Mars, which is just amazing. And why does Perseverance look at the sun sometimes? Sometimes it does so to measure the atmospheric kind of distortion or the dust environment on Mars. And also we can study the orbital dynamics of its moons, especially Phobos in this moment. So we learn a lot about what's going on around Mars as well, not just on the surface. And what's really astounding is that another lander on Mars called Mars Insight has a seismograph that can study Mars quakes and the movement of the Martian surface. And an event like this can be detected by the seismograph on the Insight lander. Because what can happen, especially when the sun's a little bit higher up, heating the Martian surface the most, when Phobos crosses over the sun, it provides just a little bit of shadow, a little bit less energy from the sun, which cools the surface in the shadow of the eclipse by a little bit. Just enough to cool the ground to a tiny extent, that ground contracts a little bit and actually changes the shape of Mars. That can be detected by a seismograph from a lander far away from this area, which is just amazing to know that we can detect those types of things from just a little shadow of a tiny moon crossing the sun on another planet. 
It's absolutely amazing. So no matter where we find eclipses, on Earth, on Mars, or elsewhere in the solar system, or even seeing eclipses of planets across other stars, it's always cool to behold these alignments in our universe that make for some very cool sights and science. Well, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy this once more. And we hope to see you also at the Museum of Arts and Sciences in person. We have so many great exhibits on display and events and programs going on. And please check out our Loman Planetarium. We're running shows every day. We also have so many great programs coming up on our schedule. So if you want any more information about all of that, please check out our website. So with that, I'd like to say happy International Dark Sky Week, and as always, happy stargazing.